Why did it say Daniel? We are in <laughs> Isaiah, but Daniel came up. I don't know why Daniel came up. Let me see, what, what is the deal here? Um, Isaiah 40B, oh, whew, there it is. Okay, I do have it. Um, all right, we're in Isaiah. So let's open it up properly. And there we are. Okay, so obviously it took me a while to get my study done, so <laughs> I was rushing at the last minute to finish it up today. Um, all right, a few quick things. We are having our, um, our family night out of the beach. Doesn't mean it's just for families. Everybody can come. And uh, so that is at 5 p.m. out of the beach. Um, and it's just simply, it's uh, where the Holiday Inn used to be and where the new Holiday Inn is, just to the left of that, as you're looking at the ocean, there's a parking lot, and we'll be right in front of there. About 5, 5 p.m., we're gonna also have a little service and a baptism if you wanna be a part of that as well. Um, but you're in, all invited out to, to come out and hang out with us uh, outside of the church walls, and that'll be a fun time. Um, and then we do have an open mic night the next, is it Friday evening? Friday evening, I should know this. Someone did sign me up for it. <laughs> I didn't do it myself, but anyways, a lot of stuff going on. You can check the website and uh, um, everything that's going on. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, as we get into uh, this passage and the, the last half of Isaiah chapter 40, Lord, it's just so encouraging um, that with the bad news, Lord, you always bring the good news. And... The good news just surrounds who you are and your ability to keep us and to save us, Lord. And may it be that, um, that we recognize that, Lord, more and more. That we can meditate on your provision, on your power, on your being, on your love, Lord, for us. And just be thankful that you have created that way through faith in Jesus, for us to be intimate with the creator of all things, Lord. And we just acknowledge you, you make everything purposeful, meaningful. And we are just so thankful for that, Lord. And so just uh, encourage us tonight, Lord, with the, the wonderful words of Isaiah chapter 40, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be looking at the second part of Isaiah chapter 40, and you're going to recognize definitely the end of this particular passage. And so as I spoke of last time, there's a distinct change in Isaiah um, at chapter 40. And previous to this, you know, we've been looking at various things that have been going on and different prophecies against different nations. But Isaiah spent a lot of time warning the people about um, their exile coming up, warning them against idols. And just recently, we've been looking at the life of Hezekiah as I, uh, Isaiah ministered uh, to him. But as we move on, we, we see this tone of hope, and, and, and it, uh, it prevails pretty much through the end of Isaiah. And, and here he's going to be painting a portrait of God in order to help us just, how, just understand how awesome... He truly is. And, and these are the things that you should spend some time meditating on. I, you know, people sometimes consider me an, an introvert. And, you know, as I read some of the things that, like, I, I am, but I'm not. Like, I'm, I'm okay around people and everything. But I just found that there, there's times when I just want to be alone and I want to dwell on the things of the Lord. And not just allow my, my, my brain to be frazzled, you know, and, and uh, worried about so many things. And um, so, you know, I, I enjoy getting in the pool and swimming. I enjoy going on a long run. I enjoy going out into the water and surfing and just, just me and, and God in a sense. And I'm not really doing anything other than during those times, just really meditating on the goodness of God. And, and I've just learned over the years to allow the imagery that God describes himself in the scriptures to explode in my brain. And I, I wish more people would do that. 
because, you know, some people might think, well, you're spacey, <laughs> you know, and the statement has been said that you're too heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Now, now here's the problem. You might be too spacey to be earthly good, but there's no way to ever be too heavenly minded that you're no earthly good, because the more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you are. And, and the more purpose and the more of an illustration you are to the world that so needs you to be in love with the Lord. And as much as this world sometimes can despise believers and, and uh, push them away, this world absolutely needs the witness of the Lord living in your life and, and you having joy in your life. This world absolutely needs to see your marriages getting better or your, your joy increasing and, and to see the sustainability as you go through trials in this world. The world needs to see this. The world needs hope right now, doesn't it? Because the only hope it has is getting old and perishing and becoming nothing and having their name forgotten <laughs> without God. And uh, so this is just a, a wonderful passage. And so we're actually going to be picking up in, in verse 12, and it starts to give a little description about the awesomeness of God. It says in verse 12, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? So it's been estimated that the world's oceans have 321,253,800 cubic miles of water in them. And what does it say? He who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. Now, God doesn't have necessarily a hand. This is called anthropology pomorphic language or giving uh, uh, something that we can understand, uh, something that we can understand, human characteristics, so we can kind of get an idea of the size of God. And so if you pick up a little bit of water in your hand and the, the part that doesn't drip through your fingers and just stays in the palm of your hand, that is all of the ocean compared to God's vastness, right? And, and that's an amazing thought. And then it says, measured with a span. And what that's saying is, and, and again, giving God characteristics of a man, even though he's spirit and he's not formed as a man, even though he appears as, as a man in uh, the Old Testament in Christophanes or Theophanes. And then he actually, um, the Holy Spirit, Jesus came as a man uh, via the Holy Spirit and the woman Mary uh, to create that sacrifice of Jesus. But when it says measured in a span, what? Heaven in a span. And biblically, there's three heavens. There's the, the heaven that, that we can breathe or our atmosphere. There's the heaven that we can see. And then there's the other dimension of heaven where God dwells, where we can't see or the spiritual realm. But this is speaking of the earthly heaven. And, and if you, you know, merely look at our solar system, it is just one star, our sun is just one star out of what they guesstimate to be 15 billion stars within the Milky Way galaxy. And the amazing thing is, as they looked out with telescopes, you know, and, and, and as we started to get better with, with magnification and all, they started to look out and they go, man, there must be thousands of galaxies with billions of stars in them. But the better telescopes get, guys, the estimation of the amount of galaxies with billions of stars in them gets into, now they're up to 40 billion galaxies. I remember just a few years ago, it was 15 billion galaxies. They guesstimated with 15 billion stars in each one of those galaxies. And what does the Bible say about the Lord right here? Nothing, span of his hand. Let's create all of these galaxies within the span of my hand. Now start to meditate on that. Blows your mind, doesn't it? It, it just becomes overwhelming. Now I've been um, preparing our next school of ministry, which <laughs> I tried to schedule last week at our staff meeting, but it didn't happen because we're, we're not 
we're less busy than normal, but we're super busy, <laughs> you know? So I'll be scheduling it in September. And, and we're gonna be going through some basic logic and, and defending your faith in a very basic way, or just really being able to break down what people are saying about God and Christianity and looking at the fallacies in people's arguments. And then beyond that, the next class we're gonna do is called Theistic Apologetics, and we're gonna be looking at the fact that there has to exist a God. If we exist, God has to exist because we are contingent beings. We don't exist on our own, we are created. But there's one non-contingent being in the universe and it has to be so by basic logic and that is God. And everywhere that anything exists at all, God has to be or else it could not exist. And this is true. So what does that mean? God exists between here and our moon, hundreds of thousands of miles away. Why? Because radiation and light exist out there. Therefore it couldn't exist unless God was there. And what about between us and the sun? 93 million miles between us and the sun, but what's between us and the sun? Well, all kinds of radiation, if you get sunburned, <laughs> you know? All kinds of, of lights and light waves and all kinds of things floating out there in a few planets. And those things couldn't exist unless God existed in that 93 million miles. And that's just to our sun, go to the edge of our, of our own solar system or go to the next star. And you start talking about light years of travel and thousands of light years of travel to the nearest sun, the nearest star. And there's 15 billion of those hanging out there and God is everywhere around them. And then you start to understand, this is God and this is our God. And it's just amazing. And it's good every once in a while to think about the vastness of the universe we live in. Remember, David said, when I look at the stars and I consider the heavens, Lord, what is man that you're even mindful of him? And I don't know if you've ever watched a video, but they have videos that, that just look at the, you know, the galaxy and then they, they go down from the galaxy to our sun and then they go down from our sun to our planet and then from our planet to our continent, from our continent to our city, from our city to the person, then to the person, to the cell in the person, right? It's just this, shoo, and God created it all. And it's not out of control for him. And it's good just to understand all the oceans are just in the palm of his hand. The, the universe is in the span of his hand, and he's also outside of it. And then we begin to look at our lives, and sometimes our lives seem so random, but the fact of the matter is God tells us that he has our lives in his hand. You know, someone described a circumstance as this, Warren Wiersbe, actually. The circumstance he described as what? Well, those nasty little things you see when you get your eyes off of God. But understand, God is so powerful that the things going on your, or in your life are not overwhelming to him, right? Hudson Taylor said this, many Christians estimate difficulty in the light of their own resources, and thus they attempt very little, and they always fail. All giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on his power and his presence to be with them. And so I look at situations, and when I look at them with my own eyes, Hudson Taylor is saying, it's overwhelming. But then when I ask God, what do you want me to do? And God tells you or leads you in a direction like, well, of course, we can do this. Is it beyond you? Absolutely, you can't do it. But with God, you can because you're looking at it from God's perspective. I always like to talk about the fact that we look around on a horizontal plane and we can tell certain people are taller and certain people are shorter. Certain people might look like they're morally better than another person, but when, when you compare it to God's vastness, no one's really tall or short. We're all dust. We're nothing, right? And, and, and when you look at people's moral aptitude, you know, you, you, you take Mother Teresa and you take Hitler compared to God's righteousness, they, they both need saving. And that's what the book of Romans is all about. God is so righteous and so awesome. So the question isn't how big are your problems, the question is how big is your God, right? And even when you get to the point of the end of your life, and I've walked with so many people through the end of their life. And my question always is, are they saved? 
Are they saved? And it's never an easy time, and some people struggle with it. God, God made us struggle with death. Why? Because he's the author of life. Death came by our choice. And so death is a struggle, and there are death gasps and things like that, because it's not part of God's plan, initial, original plan. But since we sinned, it had to be a part of his plan, or we live forever in our sinful state, which would be miserable. And so he created a doorway through death for those that love him that we might step into eternity and get a new tent and get a, get a new life, get new DNA. And it is so different when someone is strong in the Lord and they approach death. Again, it's never pretty and it's never super easy. But I've been around it enough to know the biggest question I have is do they know my God? Because my God is vast and he's taken away the sting of death. And he easily does so because he gave us life in the first place. And this is our God. And this is so encouraging to think about how awesome God is. You know, when COVID hit, one of the things it did was it gave a a, a huge ability for us to, to really look at our own souls. How afraid are we really of death or how afraid were we at death? Because when it started, it's like, oh, no, what are we going to do? Now, I tell you what, when, when, my, when my dad broke his neck um, falling off of a roof, it really rocked my world. It really did rock my world. And, and it was a test for me, for me to realize, obviously, God was doing something in my father's life, my sibling's life, my mom's life, everybody's life. He uses everything in everybody's life. He is able to do that. But he gave, me a, a, he gave me an update, a medical update on the spiritual state of my soul. And I realized, wow, I thought I was a lot stronger than this because it rocked my world so much, right? And uh, so when, when COVID hit and everybody's like, okay, so we get this thing, this is a plague and everybody's gonna die, right? Pretty early on, I looked at my wife and I said, my life is people and God never told me not to love people. And so if I die loving people, that's God's will. I'm just going to love people. And God's got this thing handled. We have no idea the CDC or nobody had any idea. But God wasn't confused and God wasn't surprised and he's still my God. And so I wanted to be wise And I certainly did not want to be fearful because perfect love casts out all fear and God loves me perfectly. And so it was good to be wise. I gave a sermon, don't fear, be wise. And I had people upset with me because I gave that sermon because they're like, no, we should be afraid. No, Christian, you're not supposed to fear. Why? God's got it handled. God's God's got it handled. And you know what? This ain't heaven. Paul said, we know that if we die, we have a heavenly tent waiting for us in heaven, not made with man's hands, right? Not knit in your mother's womb. He is recreating your body without DNA that makes you sick or that gives you cancer or that can allow you to sin anymore. You won't be doing those things and you won't be dying ever again. You know, and, and Paul looked forward to that. And Paul said, man, I'm hard pressed between these two things, man. I can die right now and be in paradise or I can stay here and keep serving the Lord, man. It's a hard thing, man. But our goal is to grow more and more in that direction, to grow more and more and more and more useful to God. So what am I saying? I'm saying dwell on God's vastness, his power, and also his love. As, as we're going to see, we need to ponder the things of the Lord. The next question is in verse 13. It says, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or as his counselor taught him, with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? So this is, this is talking about the knowledge of God. So let's just get beyond his vastness because everywhere God is in his vastness, he is also all knowledge. He is wise. And who can become his counselor? Paul was a brilliant man from what we can tell. 
so brilliant sometimes he writes super long sentences and we can't figure him out, <laughs> you know? But he was this brilliant man. But he loves to quote this idea. He, he quotes it twice in Romans eleven thirty four 34 and 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Who has become or who dare can counsel God? Remember the last chapters of Job are like, Job, who, who are you really? Come on, let me remind you who I am. And who can ponder the depth of the knowledge of God? And it's so funny, and I don't want to ruffle feathers here, but people get caught up in five points of Calvinism and seven points of Arminianism. And they get caught up in their, in their little you know, schemes and their little filters to filter God. And I'm like, man, you got five points. <laughs> My God's a little bigger than your five points. My God's also a little bigger than your seven points. Uh, you know, and, and you're telling me you got it all figured out, but then you got to excuse away other parts of the Bible that you can't even begin to understand. And I tell you what, I, I've been on both sides of that argument. And I would argue both sides of that argument. And it was so freeing. Once I, once I gathered enough understanding of God under my belt to say, I can't understand the fullness of God. He is beyond me. And it was so freeing to go, whoa, God, whatever you send my way, I want to learn and I don't want to filter it away. I want to know your awesomeness. And I want to trust in all of what you say without putting blinders on so I can't see other elements of the depth of who you are. So with whom did he take counsel when he created everything? Did he ask you? Did he ask you how to create quantum physics? Did he ask you how to create gravity? Did he ask you how to create reason in these little things that walk around on this little speck of dust? He didn't ask you, he, he created it. This is our God who loves us, who communicated with us. So guys, when we pray, you're praying to a God who, who, who knows all things. There was an old movie when I was young, it was called Father Knows Best. You couldn't, that'd be so in, uh, politically incorrect today, I can't even, <laughs> you know, it would be <laughs> just run off the edge of the earth, right? Father knows best. Are you kidding me? You, you can't say that anymore. But I tell you what, as a Christian, I can say my heavenly father knows best. And there's, there's just no doubt about it. He will always know the right direction. He always knows the right tension to put on us, too. And sometimes, you know, it's often said, you know, God is never late. I love that. But what I don't like about that is he's never early either. He's right on his time, <laughs> you know. And he wants me to be patient at times because he, I'm learning lessons in the waiting. There's a point where David says, I waited upon waiting upon the Lord. And he says, I'm busy waiting upon the Lord. So I'm learning lessons even as I'm waiting upon the Lord. And, and as we wait for the Lord, there's lessons to be learned. There always is something going on. And he knows perfectly exactly what you need. He has a curriculum for each one of us that is different because he knit each one of us in, his mother, in our mother's wombs. And he knew where we would be right now today. And he's got his curriculum for us and the testing, and the patient levels for us. Verse 15 goes on, it says, Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket, and are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him as less than nothing and worthless. It's interesting because the, the imagery is kind of lost on us, but the idea of the, the nations are like dust on a scale. And what it's saying is when you would go into the market to buy something at a certain weight, they would weigh it out. And in order for you to know 
that the, that the person selling you something is weighing it properly, they would dust off imaginary dust off the scale. There's nothing there, right? How much does dust weigh? And so what that, that is referring to an ancient idea of getting any extra speck of dust to know that the person is being fair. And what does he say? He says, the nations are like dust, scale dust, which is absolutely nothing. So we look at great nations, or we look at nations that are, you know, popping their heads up around the, what, what, is, I, what is Iran to God? What, what is their, their nuclear arsenal? Now, I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't be concerned about that politically. But personally, as a believer, God knows what Iran is trying to develop and that they hate Israel. What, what is this, this crazy man in, in, in North Korea to God? God knows. <clears throat> He's trying to develop missiles that can reach California with a, with a nuclear warhead. And I don't live in California not because of that. <laughs> They're crazy politics, maybe, but not because of, of worrying about this guy. Because God knows. What, what are these people? God knows the end from the beginning. And he knows how to protect those that are his. And if a nuclear bomb was to drop on my head, I wouldn't show up at he- in heaven a minute early or a minute late. And the forests of Lebanon, Lebanon w- would have like sequoia trees. You know, they were famous for the, their wood because they, they had these huge trees. And, and they're nothing. They're not sufficient to burn unto God. The greatest of animals is not a, a good enough sacrifice for God. They're just merely symbols compared to the awesomeness of God. Verse 18 goes on and says, To whom will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image. The, golds, uh, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold. And the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution, chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. What is he saying? He's saying people set up idols in their lives, and, and, and they really think they compare to God. There's a reason God said, don't create a graven image, because, because you can't even begin to grasp the image of God. Any image you create of God is a, uh, is a disappointment. And you end up trusting in this particular image. And you just, you can't do it. And it's just really sad. But over the years, you know, over the decades and over the centuries and the millennia, you see that people will set up for themselves gods all over the place. Why? Man was created to worship the true and living God. But when in, in their sinful rebellion, they still have this desire to worship, and they're going to worship something. And every culture worships something. The official religion of the United States today is humanism, worshiping of self, worshiping of, of humanity. We can solve any of our own problems. How's that working for us? The problem is we're sinful and broken. And all we do is multiply it. And that, the, the higher we raise our own wisdom above God's, the, the bigger trouble we get in. And we're just proving it right now, right? But we can make our own selves an idol, which is foolish. I know myself. I'm certainly not an idol, you know? And it's a scary thing, right? I, as you get older, and if you're younger here, understand this. You're going to get older, and you're going to realize, I'm of average, I might be of higher intelligence, you know, maybe I have a college degree, and, and you think about this, and then you start thinking, oh my gosh, I know me, and people my age, and even younger than me, are running the world. That's really scary, because I know me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we are in a precarious place, 
Lord, keep me, <laughs> you know, hold on to me, because it is, it's just crazy, right? But I have God, and others have idols. An idol over the Almighty Creator is just ridiculous. Verse 21, have you not known, have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. So he's chastising the Jews. Don't you, don't you know your own God and the vastness of who he is? You've probably seen the pictures or heard about it in school. You know, some, some cultures think that, you know, the earth is balanced on the back of a big elephant. Others have this image of a man named Atlas holding up the earth. People have all kinds of weird ideas. But here it asks, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in? It's a good question. It also says in Job, he stretches out the north over the empty space and he hangs the earth on nothing. Now, this is something that sometimes when I'm driving or I'm alone or I'm out in the water surfing or I'm doing something that, that I'll just let my mind start to dwell on. But can you imagine there's absolutely nothing except for God? And he starts to speak. <laughs> There's something there. It's a little crowded here. Let's spread it out faster than the speed of light. <laughs> Could you imagine the forces that are taking place? Could you imagine the, the, the heat, the radiation, the explosions, the, the absolute just splendor, the brightness, the craziness of all that force, just energy and mass just exploding forth as God speaks it into existence. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? And what are we? Well, we're nothing compared to that, but at the same time, we're objects of God's love. Because again, the same God looked down at these creatures that he created because he wanted to have fellowship with you. So here's you, there's God, and he wants to have fellowship with you, but you've rebelled against him. And so he decides to allow all of his character to be placed in a man so this man can live this perfect life, Jesus Christ. So that he could die in your sinful little place so that you can have some type of fellowship with him. You know, the amazing thing about Christianity is some people get to a point and they think they're done growing. Knock it off. If that's you, you will never get to the bottom of God because the more you actually start to search him out, the more your brain realizes he's unattainable and he gets bigger and bigger and bigger exponentially. You grow a little bit, you know a little bit more about him and you're scratching the surface. But so your knowledge grows, but the knowledge of your, not, of your ignorance grows more too. And so I call it the beautiful pursuit of ignorance because my God becomes more vast the more I seek after him. And you guys know me, I, lo I love to learn. I'm, I'm, my nose is always in a book. And I'm always blowing my mind. And then, you know, I bug people sometimes because I'm like, streets of gold. Wow. That's, that's John trying to describe something that's indescribable. And they get really mad when I say heaven is all that, but it's so much more because John didn't have the words to, to describe what he was seeing. And Paul, with all the words in the world, said it, it wouldn't be lawful for me to even speak of what I saw. Paul, of all people, and God shut up Paul. That's pretty an amazing thing, right? <laughs> you know, the, the awesomeness of God. And, and so I, I, one time a, a friend called me, and his wife had been sick, and he is a pastor of a church up in Dallas. And he's, he's one of my mentors. And so his, uh, 
His wife had passed away fairly suddenly, but she had been sick for a long time, so it wasn't too much of a surprise. But the second week after um, her death, you know, the first week someone else spoke, but he had called me, and I flew up there, and I spoke for him. And um, I just finished a course on the, the theistic proof of, of the existence of this God. And, and he actually came to church that day. And, and, and the best thing I could do for him is to share what I had been learning about the awesomeness of my, of my God. And that, you know, I didn't say it to him specifically. I was teaching his congregation, but he was there. And the idea is just, dude, your wife is no longer suffering in pain. She's in the presence of God, you know, which is an awesome thing, you know. And, and for us, again, that perspective just needs to grow. Don't think that you've ever reached a place where you're done learning about your God. And I think he is so vast that even when our brains work much better in heaven, I don't think we're ever going to get to the end of him because we're still contained in a body and he still is everywhere in the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. He's everywhere. And he's also outside of that new place that he creates. Think on that. Okay, you guys are going to have a hard time driving home because you're going to be like, I'm not drunk, officer. I'm just like, I'm thinking about God, you know. (laughs) But he is an awesome God. I, 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 hope, I hope this is coming through. <laughs> I love this passage. Verse 23, he brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcity shall be planted. Scarcity shall, be, uh, shall they be sown. Scarcity shall their stock take root in the earth. When he will also blow on them. And they will all wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like the stubble. And so as hard as these people press into foolishness and stupidity, and they, 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 they try to tell you, oh, Mother Nature created all this. Isn't this obvious? And hasn't science proved it? And you're like, no. And, uh, but, but everybody believes, dumb arguments, or, or you guys are so dumb. You are the problem because you think a man is a man and a woman is a woman. You actually think women have children. What kind of fools are you? You know, and, and we're running into this. And these are powerful people from our perspective as we look horizontally, right? But the Bible says, in the beginning, God created man, male and female. He created him. That was God's doing. That's not... I. I my, my opinion can't fight that. And you know what? Science actually proves it. <laughs> Science proves that one. But he brings these great men to nothing. What are great men of the earth without God? We talked about Antiochus Epiphanes last Sunday. Maybe you had heard of him. You probably hadn't heard of the nickname that the Jews gave him, Antiochus the crazy man. And, and you probably didn't realize he was actually Antiochus IV and the uncle of the guy that actually should have, you know, you didn't know all this. How many of you guys, you know, can, can, can name all the presidents? Well, maybe if you're under 20 and just went through a classical education of school, but these guys were the big, big, big people in this, you know, country. And, and then we just think we're something. And people think, They've created something in all reality. What did they really do? Like you might know a president's name, but you don't even know what party they came from. Do you guys know the name Polk? Eh, Some of you recognize that. Yeah, Polk, you know. What kind of president was he? But he was the president, right? Right? And so we, we build this up, but without God, what are we? With God, what are we? We're a child of God, and he knows my name. So great men of the earth are nothing without God. Whatever they do adds up to nothing. God will blow on them, and they're gone. I love Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? And we're seeing this. And the people plot a vain thing. 
the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who, hits, uh, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. I don't know if you guys realize this, Karl Marx was an absolute racist. An absolute racist. And he hated the Jews, although he himself was Jewish. Self-hatred. But then you have these, these BLM people saying, well, we are trained Marxists. Marxists. Marx hated black people. He thought they should be removed off the face of the earth so that the planet could actually advance further. Think about that. And, and, and then people are, are, like, think about the foolishness of man. And you need to understand this, you know, Marxism is basically communism, uh, it's atheistic communism, uh, Communism, like no, no religion whatsoever, can't have it. You know, the government is your provider, your God. And um, Lenin, I just learned this today as I was listening to some history stuff. Lenin actually invited the Pope to come and speak to his nation because he realized the people were becoming so immoral, they were out of control, and he could not control them, and he realized they needed God. He didn't want to know God, but he realized they were in such great trouble because they had no morality without God. Duh! Right? Castro did the same thing. Castro tried to take God out, but now there's actually, there's some Calvary chapels in Cuba because they had to invite God back in because they were in such trouble morally. You know, and, and uh, men think they got it down. They don't got it down. And, and I think as we've looked at these last couple of years, we definitely know this, right? Men don't have it figured out. What are, what are they? And so the nations rage and they rage against the Lord and they say, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Now, what does that word mean? It means absolute disrespect. He's got no respect for them. What? He's just like, no, th this isn't it, right? And then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And here's the thing. You know, we look at these, oh yeah, all these people need to do is turn and repent and God will love them with all the love that he loves you and I with. That's called grace. He will forgive every sin. The blood of Jesus can forgive every sin. It isn't like, oh, I'm just gonna hate you forever. But you know what? In that attitude, you're, you're in big trouble, buddy. Take all the warning that you can have. They are nothing without God. Verse 25, to whom will you liken me? To whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by the number, meaning the stars, and calls them all by name? These billions upon billions and trillions of stars out there. He can, he, he's surrounding each one at all times or else they couldn't exist. And he can name every single one. This is our God. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Who are you going to turn to help for help? Your hairdresser? Sorry, I know some great hairdressers. But I'm still going to choose God's wisdom over theirs. Right? The bartender? Listen, you shouldn't even listen to your pastor unless he's submitted to the word of God. And unfortunately, there's a lot of pastors out there who are wise in their own eyes and who have, le who have left the word of God behind. This is why we hand out Bibles and have Bibles available because you need to be just as close to God as I, 
right? You need to have any of the knowledge I'm here. I'm just here to barf out everything I possibly can every week. That's my job, right? As long as it's not my wisdom, it's good for you. If it's my wisdom, eh. Temporary band-aid, maybe for a very short time. But the Lord's wisdom is eternal. So who are you going to go to? Who are you going to who are you going to run to? Little statues. You know, it's so funny because um, these people. Th- there was a there, there's different groups of people that lived in the area of Petra, which is in southern Jordan today. Uh, it used to be in Edom. It was a place that Solomon controlled at one time, but there was various different groups. And, and these different groups had different gods, but one of their gods they had kind of looked like SpongeBob. And what they would do is, when they would take a long trip, they would take a bunch of figs, because the, the palm trees create you know, uh, different fruits. So they'd take the palm fruits, whatever they were, right? And, um, or dates, I guess, dates, date trees, date palms. And they would squish them together in the form of their God, and then they would carry their God with them. And then if they ran out of food, they could say, my God saved me, because they ate them. <laughs> you know? But what are you going to trust in? A, a, a bunch of figs or a bunch of dates squished together to look like SpongeBob? Is that what you're going to worship? You know? Where do you run when you're in trouble? Now, now, we think idols are, are kind of foolish, but you know what we can do? We can create idols in our own life. You know, we have hidden idols, things that kind of entertain us or take our brains away from things or, or cause us to relax, and, and, and we're, repl- we're, we're not running to God, we're running to these other things. And it might be money, it might be accomplishments, it might be pleasure, it might be alcohol, it might be all kinds of things. But watch out, because we are idol collectors and, and, and I've always got to watch out. I've got to be accountable or else I can entertain my brain to death. You know, uh, do, you, do you chain read romance novels? Or do you, instead of your reading your Bible at all? You know what I'm saying? We, we can do this. It is an easy thing to do. I mean, someone was just asking me if I knew so-and-so surfer out here. And I realized surfing can become an idol to me instead of a tool. Right, And so when I moved out here, I purposefully did not get involved in the surfing community because I knew it could eat up all my time. Now, it's not that I don't know a bunch of surfers here in town and everything, but it came by more naturally, and I didn't present myself as you know, someone in the surfing community just because I knew it could become an idol in my life. Even that, right? But people can develop idols. Be careful. You don't have to have a, a, you know, a date SpongeBob you know, to say you have an idol. You can create idols out of almost anything. And be careful. Where do you go to find your peace? Do you go to the medicine cabinet or do you go to the Lord first? Where do you go? Verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, meaning the nation of Israel, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my God. And so why do you feel like God isn't really paying attention to you or God really doesn't know you is what he's asking. And then it goes on in verse 28. Have you not known? To answer his question, why do you feel this way? Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those that have no might, he increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. So he's saying, don't you know your own God? That he, he never grows weary? He doesn't faint, but he gives power to those that might faint, might grow weary. His understanding, it is unsearchable. It is beyond our ability to even begin to to understand. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. 
Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And I tell you what, when you run into people that have God figured out and they're judging you, it's like, no. Right? Because Isaiah, Isaiah, Psalm, Psalm, and Romans, and there's many other places. Job, chapters of Job, just say, you, you don't got it. God is God. And if God is God, you cannot figure him out completely. If you could, you, by definition, would be God. And he is beyond us. He is above us. But the thing is, he gives us so many reasons for us to trust him. And so the fact that he is always, the, the, for, for my ability to grasp all of God, it, it's just not there. And it, it just gives me such freedom. Sometimes people ask me a question, I go, huh, I don't know. I, I've never thought about that. And they look at me like, you're supposed to know you're a pastor. I'm like, no, I'm just a human being who happens to be a pastor, but I, I can't know everything about God. I can't answer every question. And I tell you what, as a young man, I thought I had to have everything nailed down. And, and I always tried to figure everything out. But even yesterday, we were just, we, we, we were trying to give an illustration of like, like, you know, how does God know everything and then I still have free will? And it's like, I can give you a thousand illustrations, but every single one of those illustrations is something me as a man tries to understand. And at a point, it still goes, and my brain still fries. I don't get it at a point. It just, okay. You know, what is the Trinity? It's like an egg. It's like a piece of paper. It's height, width, and depth. It's, it's like this, you know, and I have my way of describing it, but even my way of describing it, you know, after all these years of kind of rejecting all those other ones, uh, he's God. I'm not. I'm one person, <laughs> you know, and I live in my own little head, you know, my sinful little head, and I think I have it figured out. But in ultimate reality, he's God. And it is so nice to allow him to be God. I just want him to keep on teaching me. And as long as I'm open, he's going to keep on revealing himself to me. Once I think I have it all figured out, oh, you know it all. You guys ever run into a know-it-all? <laughs> and, you're, and you're like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, you just got to do that, you know. But if people are, are hungry for your knowledge, man, you're, you're going you're gonna to want to share with them all that you can if, if you actually have some knowledge to give them. It says, even the you shall faint and be weary. I tell you what, people, people think that, that I, as I approach 60, have some energy, right? I watch the little kids after service around the church, and I'm like, I am so ready for a nap. And they are running so hard, their faces are all red. I'm like, man. I always say to live life backwards, to have knowledge and energy at the same time. <laughs> it's just such a frustrating thing, right? Because when we have energy, we're not very wise. And when we're wise, we have no energy left, right? But even you, Slo, you, you, you watch these little kids and, you know, and, and I've raised children. <laughs> Eventually, they, they, they knock out. You know, as much as my dogs want to fetch and run and walk and everything else, man, a few minutes later, they're laying on the kitchen floor snoring. You know? But not God. He never grows weary. And the beautiful thing is, the last verse is, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. It is such a blessing to seek to serve the Lord. And listen, I have slowed down immensely. I'm in it for the long haul. I want to minister until the day I drop, right? So I, I'm, I'm trying to be wise with this, but I know if God has something else for me to do, he's going to give me the energy, and he's also going to give me the wisdom to do it. I was on a, a phone call with a friend of mine and some other guys that are 
much younger than both of us, you know, but my friend is seven years older than me, just, just turned 65, and he's a pastor. A couple years ago, he's thinking about retiring, and he goes, I ain't going to retire. And so I was on this phone call, and, and we're making plans with these younger men, you know, to plant some more churches and to see how we could minister to more people as, as a group of churches, you know. And so we had this, this, uh, this meeting, and I was just so blessed to see my friend, who's seven years older than me, still making plans for the future because he wants to see God move, and he understands this. And, and uh, he's a mentor to me, and, and, and I love him. And uh, I'm just so blessed to see that. You're not done until you're done, right? And if he has something for you, he's going to give you the proper energy for that particular thing. Again, he makes us wise. If you're older, minister to the younger. Minister to those that have energy. The key to our church remaining united is not having different worship services You know, for the old people and the suit and tie, you know, and then for the younger people, you know, in their 50s and 60s, and then, you know, have have a worship service for those in their 30s, and then have another worship service for those, you know, we'll do rap worship for the younger ones or what. The idea is, as you get older, be filled with more love and more grace and minister to those that are young and dumb with a lot of energy and be there, be there, be there, be their wisdom. And, and I've been blessed. I've, I've always had older, older men pouring into me, and I still do today, and I'm still blessed. But I realize I'm an older man, and I need to pour into those that are younger, and that's my heart. And they can do it. That's how the church stays united, that we're a team. And uh, live in a respectable way so the young people can respect you. They'll see right through you if you're living it like a hypocrite. But the Lord's promise is this. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The idea of changing clothes, putting on fresh clothes. He's going to give you that strength when you need it. And he's going to take our weaknesses and he's going to, he's going to turn it into his strength. William Carey, a missionary to India, he said this. He said, I can plod. I can plod. That's my only genius. I can persevere in any definite pursuit. To this I owe everything. I can plod. It was funny, when I was was starting to pursue uh, further education, I was talking to, um, actually, your son-in-law, Bernie. (laughs) And he said, you don't need to be smart to get a doctorate degree. You just need to be persistent. And you know what? He was right. He was right, because only about 10% of those that start a doctor degree finish it. Why? Because they got to write a paper that's like 250 pages that's actually researched properly, right? But anybody can do it. You just got to be persistent to do it, right? And that's why there's a bunch of dumb people with doctorate after their name, (laughs) you know, including me, (laughs) because I was stubborn enough not to give up, right? But you know what? We'll translate into that into spiritual language. Stubborn faith. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on your faith. Walk your walk. Be persistent with God. Paul would say it this way, stand fast. Stand fast. And God will, will use you until you're done. And he always has something more to do. There's a Baptist pastor whose daughter died of leukemia. The pastor went up and he taught the very next Sunday. And he preached on this very verse. He says, sometimes you mount up with wings like an eagle and fly. We're on top of the world. Sometimes we run, and t- sometimes we just need to keep on walking. He says, that's where I am right now. I'm barely walking, but I need your prayers, but I'm going to keep on walking. Psalm 23, 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We can fly, we can run, and we can walk, but the Lord just wants you to keep on moving. And he is with you. <clears throat> and he's always with you. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the othermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to you. So wherever you're at in life, whatever disappointment you're in, you're in, the Lord has never forgotten you, and he never will forgot you, forget you. You know, and even though, you know, you, you might be on your deathbed, you might be gasping for breath, the Lord hasn't left you. Why? He gave us that promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you, ever. And even though your soul may be separated from your body, your soul, if you're a believer, will never, ever be separated from your God ever, ever, ever again for all of eternity. And this is this mighty God. Blow your mind on that. When I look in the mirror, I can go, man, you're an awesome dude. Problem is, I know myself. I can, I can take off my shirt and try to flex and everything will wiggle because there's muscles under there somewhere. And I can tell myself how buff I am, and all reality, it's not true. I'm not all about self-esteem. I'm about the fact that God loves me, and that, makes, that gives me value. And that gives me purpose, and it gives me a future, and it gives me a hope. This is how we are to live. You know, and I, I, don't, I don't like it that my, my dad died. I don't like it that I buried my mom also. I don't like it that I buried my, my um, mother-in-law, my father-in-law. I don't, I don't like it that, that, I, that I do funerals, but when I know people really love the Lord and, and the, the hurt is gone and the memory's still there, the scar's there, but the hurt is gone, I'm kind of jealous. You know, I used to think as a young man, man, they're missing out on so much. Uh-uh. They're in the presence of this God that I know better than ever. You know, I, I want to have the attitude of Paul. That, that, man, I'm hard-pressed. You know, I, I, I have a grandchild coming. I'm so excited. But if Jesus comes before, I'll see him in heaven, right? Before he's born. You know, and how can I say this? Is that blasphemous? No, it's just like I'm getting to know God better the older I get. And when that day comes, I can't wait to see him face-to-face, -face, and he can't wait for me to see him face-to-face. -face. That's what he prayed that the, the they would see his glory, the fullness of his glory. Not, not merely the beautiful character of God all stuffed into this little human being, but all of his glory with all of his character together. What an incredible day that will be. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll close with a song. Dear God, we, um, we thank you for the encouragement. Lord, may it be that we absolutely do just dwell on your vastness, your creativity, your knowledge, your love, your personableness, your care, your tenderness, your attention. And Lord, when we face this world, may we just know to us, things surprise us. To you, <laughs> you laugh with disrespect. <laughs> and uh, may we just hold on to you and, and be wise and not fearful in these wild times in which we're living. Lord, we want to be of best use to you until we're done and that we get to step into heaven with you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.